Hi everyone, I just wanted to make a quick video again, and this time about the other weapon system that we train at HDN, our club, uh, Military Saber. Now, unfortunately, uh, all of my Military Sabers are in the training hall, but as I said in my previous video, you don't need an actual steel sword to train swordsmanship, so I just made an impromptu little training tool. This is just a broom handle that I cut down to 100 centimeters in length, a little tape on one end to have a grip and this is perfectly serviceable for training military saber with and also for demonstrating. Now what I wanted to do in this video is give a quick overview of the system of guards that we use at HVN and we uh, base that on the manual of Christian Siebenhaar, a 19th century military saber instructor from the Netherlands. Now um, because I wanted this video to be useful for both internal club use as well as external use for anybody interested in Dutch military saber, I am going to go over the system of guards in a little bit more general terms first, just um, so that people who are not familiar with the system uh, will have a bit of a background and a basis in it. Um, then I'll get into a little bit more detail and that could be interesting for people who train military saber with HVN as well. Now, first. The system that Christian Siebenheim uses for its guards is very, very simple. There are only three, and they simply work from the inside out. Now, first the stance. Uh, what Siebenheim advocates is a centered stance that is slightly back-weighted. And the way you get that is you want the knee of your back foot to be right over the toes, and the knee of your front foot to be right over the heel. And that automatically makes you slightly back-weighted, favoring the rear leg. This will help with voiding with the front leg and lunges, as we discussed in my um, earlier video. Now, that covers stance. Now, guards. The first guard is on the inside, with the fingernails up, the edge aimed out, and the point aimed off to the right side. This guard will cover horizontal cuts towards the cheek and shoulder and neck, anything above chest height. Same goes for the second guard. Fingernails are now down and the arm is slightly relaxed. Edge is facing out towards the right. The point is facing out towards the left. And again, this covers anything above chest height on my right side. Third guard, hand goes up, point remains more or less forward and this covers anything coming down towards the head. Now, that's the foundation of um, guard work according to Siebenhaar. Now let's get into a little bit more details. Now like I just said, this covers everything above the chest. What about stuff however coming in below chest height? Anything below this line over here is not covered with one, two, or three in this way. The way Ziemannar advocates to cover that, for instance an attack towards the thigh or the side or the stomach, is all done in exactly the same way. You use your third guard, the point comes low and the foot goes behind the rear foot. You maintain weight on this foot here and you sort of go on point, to use a, a, a dancing term, right here. There's, very, there's barely any weight over here, and this is a very temporary move. So, if I cut towards my side, for instance, I lower the point, and the foot goes to the rear. This removes the immediate target, and just for security's sake, I also put my sword in the way, just in case I misjudge distance, or I'm not out of the way entirely. That pretty much covers everything, but now let's go into specific details of implementation of these guards, because this is where a lot of people seem to um, use the guards in a suboptimal way for what they meant for. Uh, as an example, let's go in front. What a lot of people do, especially people that come from a longsword background and into a saber background, is that they use their first and second guards the way they would use plow, meaning that they keep their hand relatively low and use it to cover everything 
pretty much above waist height. Now, if you're looking at this, you can already guess that this is suboptimal for horizontal cheek cuts because what I'm using now to cover my cheek, if the strike were to come in, is the weak of my blade, not the strong of my blade. The strong of my blade is somewhere below near my belly button. So, if I wanted to cover anything above chest height coming up at me horizontally, I would have to raise my hand at chest or shoulder height, like so. This is a proper guard for guarding against horizontal cuts on the sides towards the cheeks. There are several reasons why people have a tendency to keep their hand relatively low. I think the main one is that they want to cover as much surface area as possible to protect themselves on the entire right side. Now, uh, this basically is fooling yourself. As I just said, if you're covering yourself like this, you're basically only covering yourself with strikes coming in over here somewhere, and even that, yeah, it's suboptimal. You really want to cover yourself chest up like so. Uh, another reason could be that, as with plow, people want to keep the point aimed at the opponent's face, and if you've got it at chest height or something, that doesn't really make it, uh, yeah, that, that breaks the guard, so they put it over here. Um, having the point aimed at the opponent, uh, I'm not saying that it's not done in Siebenhauer military saber fencing, but it's less of a thing, so all you want is for the point to cover the opponent, to go over the opponent, you don't want the point aimed directly at the opponent. That um, negates the defensive potential of this guard, that is, covering with the strong horizontal strikes coming in at your cheek or shoulder. Same thing from the inside, you want it to be at chest height or even a little bit higher, covering the entire opponent with the blade. Now, the same thing also seems to be happening when people attack low targets, people want to um, bring the blade down and cover as much of the low target as possible, but in doing so, they expose targets in the process as well. Because what people do when they put the point down like this, a lot of people have a tendency, especially when the leg is being attacked, to bring the hand down as well, to bring the strong towards where the blade is. Now, uh, usually that isn't a bad instinct, but what happens here is that in bringing the hand down, they expose the arm to attack as well. Because the theory here is that anything below chest height, from chest down to the knee, is, done, uh, is protected in exactly the same way. Hand is at shoulder height, point is low, foot is in the rear. Because it's very hard to distinguish a, a side cut with a thigh cut with something lower towards the knee. So if you misjudge that, if, you're, uh, if you think your thigh is being attacked, but instead your side is being attacked and you bring your hand down, boom, you get your hand locked off. So, because of that, always keep the hand relatively high and the point low. Uh, yes, this will bring the weak of the blade over the knee and the shin, but if somebody is attacking your shin, this is not the, uh, the defense that you want to do according to Ziegenhaar. Shin attacks and foot attacks basically are not parried, you only void and immediately attack the head. Because if somebody attacks the shin, they're overextended and you don't need to really worry about parrying in that case. Just slip the leg, attack the head. So, that's about specifics of the guard. And in order to um, practice this, it's a very simple thing. Uh, what a lot of people do when they move around a lot, people usually start off in a proper guard, hand at shoulder height, but as soon as they start switching guards a lot and moving around a lot, they get lazy a little bit, and then the hand drops. So, just as I, like I said in the, last class, uh, in the last video, you want to be disciplined when st uh, under stress. So you want to stress yourself when practicing, just a little bit. So, when starting off, just get in your proper position, offhand in the side, this knee goes over the toes, this knee goes over the, over the heel, 
and you're in your proper second guard, for example, switch to first, switch to second, switch to third, switch to second, defend the side, switch back to second. Just do a lot of guard switches that way. Um, you can do combinations of this. For instance, uh, Ziebenhaar has a lot of uh, feints, feint to the cheek, feint to the cheek, strike the side. You can use those combinations just statically first. So, feint to this cheek, cover this line. Feint to this cheek, cover this line. Attack the side, cover that line. Repeat. Cheek, cheek, side. Repeat. Cheek, cheek, side. Any sort of combination will work, um, just so long as you uh, switch often between guards and high and low. Now, as soon as you've done that, you can start to stress yourself a bit by adding a lot of footwork and switching guards while doing that. And every so often, once you've done that, you want to stop and re-examine your guard. And if you've noticed, my hand dropped, and I want to prevent that. I want to be able to use proper footwork and maintain a proper guard. Once you've done that, once you are able to use footwork and guard work simultaneously without losing the proper guard, you can add combinations as well, combinations of uh, parries. So you can now move, 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 parry, 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 reset, move again. Stress yourself a little bit, but keep checking that guard, yeah? So that's basically it. Um, like I said, the system is very simple, but knowing the goals and purposes behind each of the parries and guards is very important because that will help you to maintain proper form and that will help you to stay safe and be a better saber fencer in the end. Thank you very much. See you next time.